Capitalism will end just naturally by natural processes. Which then means for Marx that supposedly enchantment will end. And yeah, naturally. It's just, it's going to go through its, its period of real disenchantment is coming. This is light trails and blazes with the map getting wrong, sticking labels on this song. Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who study philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I am Troy Polidori. And this week we are going to be delving into a broader set of concerns spurred on by an article written by historian slash theologian, maybe, uh, Eugene McCarraher. And the title of the article was called We Have Never Been Disenchanted, and it is about um, dispelling the myth of secular disenchantment, the idea that we have uh, released ourselves from the bonds of mystification and uh, spiritual delusionment and things like that. So we're going to jump into that and see what we have to say. Um, I'm actually working through the larger book. I recommended the book, I believe, on my Sticky Leaves the last time, didn't I? Um, you did. That I had a Sticky Leaves. And so it's a large tome. It's this huge historical piece, and it's very readable. I would definitely recommend people check it out, but it's long as fuck. So if you're interested in the condensed argument, read this little article. Uh, we have never been disenchanted. You can find it. It's open access online. So just give it a quick Google. Eugene McCarraher, M-C-C-A-R-R-A-H-E-R, -R -R -E something like that. So yeah. So that's what we're going to get up to. Yeah, man? Yeah. We've got a few things to do before we get into that, though. Yeah? Okay, cool. Let's do some housekeeping. You start. So- we uh, have mentioned before that if you give us a five-star rating and review on iTunes or any of the other major platforms and you ask a question in your review, as long as we can answer it in a couple of minutes, we will try our best to do so. We have a new review uh, from Chaz, and Chaz asks that uh, about the book Monstrosity of Christ, written by John Milbank and Slavoj Žižek. I think it came out about 10 or so years ago, yeah? Gosh, maybe, yeah. And uh, Milbank and Žižek go back and forth on the idea of Christ, and Chaz is wondering... If uh, you or we have read it, and if so, any thoughts, and how the idea of Christ fits or does not fit into current philosophical project. So, I don't know about you, Austin, but I read this book back in back in the day. <laughs> Probably in <laughs> and, grad school, right? I uh, don't remember anything about it, do you? <laughs> Did you read this in undergrad or uh, when you were in the UK? Yeah, when I was in the UK. Yeah, Um yeah, it must have been the same. Um, and then, of course, I studied under John Milbank at the University of Nottingham, where I did my master's degree when he was still there. Um, and I don't remember anything about the book per se, but I did just finish rereading Theology and Social Theory. So you and I were kind of just joking around about this beforehand, but so I think I get the idea. And then, of course, you obviously are familiar both with him and with Zizek. So the way you put it, what? Like we get their shticks? So Yeah, I'll, I only have like meta remembrance of it, right? Not remembering yeah, the same. actual text, remember like my reaction to the text, which was, you know, Zizek is known for being like Morrissey and repackaging his ideas and even his jokes over and over again into, you know, successive texts. Um and so he has a shtick. And uh, it, all I remember is having read Theology and Social Theory and a bunch of Zizek that Monstrosity of Christ was more just a kind of a way of repackaging some of their stuff um, into a dialectical, you know, back and forth. Um, more so Zizek than Milbank, but still, they both kind of have their shticks and they, and they kind of just repackaged into that book. Not, not to say that the book is necessarily bad for that reason. It's probably a good way to, to introduce um, the two thinkers, the, the little essays in there are are pretty good encapsulations of their thinking around religion and Christianity and, and uh, Christology and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, that, that unfel unhelpful, it's like unhelpful in terms of like remembering the actual arguments in the text offhand. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if we can just broadly, I imagine from what I know of Zizek that he would have appealed greatly to that GK Chesterton line that he loves, who he calls his favorite theologist um, <laughs> where he talks about, Jesus on the cross becoming an atheist himself, so that God himself becomes an atheist, which is this idea that in his very Hegelian dialectical 
project that um, that history empties itself, alienates itself, a kind of story of the fall, if you will, a retelling of the fall via the Hegelian dialectic, and that God kind of, there's this moment of kenosis, that God empties himself through the historical process, and so that uh, for Zizek, uh, there is no real contradiction between Christianity and atheism because atheism is kind of, if you will, um, the necessary culmination of a certain historical project, right? Which then I think culminates in Pentecost for both, I would say, Hegel and Zizek, which is the idea that the spirit is poured out in the community. So you no longer need the personal God up in the heaven, the transcendent, you don't have that duality anymore between us and then the transcendent, but it's collapsed into a pure sort of imminent historical project whereby the community becomes impelled forward uh, via, let's say, the dialectical flow of the spirit, which then becomes the culmination of his Christianity. It sounds about right? Yeah, exactly. It's like a supercharged um, Trinitar like process Trinitarianism, right? where the Father, the Son, and the Spirit resemble like these historical periods, but also these notions of God, and then also these notions of, um, of social change uh, and then the social makeup. So um, Zizek's kind of in the Hegelian way using these kind of religious symbols to um, kind of show how he thinks Christianity can be used to picture um, something like an, you know, the uh, dialectical... Um, atheistic Marxism that he ultimately wants to wants to posit. And of course, Milbank is going to come from a very different way of thinking, um, much more literal in terms of its uh, sort of cathexis towards Christian doctrine. And you just finished reading Theology and Social Theory, but um, it's something like the idea that for Milbank, all, all knowledge can only be based on um, fundamentally Christian principles, right? There is no sort of um, genuine understanding or knowledge that exists outside of uh, foundational Christian principles, right? Yeah, it's kind of, they kind of come at this from opposite directions. And so I think Milbank's argument is that Zizek espouses a world of the fall, a world of difference, a world of conflict. And it is through the dialectic, let's say through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in God's own kenosis or in history's own kenosis and emptying, that it kind of like um, accumulates enough capacity to resolve the difference, right? Or to at least have some sort of balance, maybe not like a pure resolution, but some sort of culmination, if you will, of differences in a type of um, state of reciprocity, right? But Milbank's criticism is that 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 operates fundamentally ontologically according to what he calls an ontology of violence whereas milbank's own position is presuming what he calls an ontology of peace and so what that means is that rather than um, there being some sort of uh, system of difference and of conflict that we try to manage and mitigate through you know prayer or through, uh, you know, the capitalist system, which is one of the criticisms that Milbank would level, um, rather than doing all of that, because those things can never actually resolve the problems that they're trying to, to get to cosmos or harmony, rather than do that, we presume an ontology of peace because of the incarnation, which speaks of, or which is the culmination and fulfillment of um, of the redemption of the notion of the fall itself. So what you have then is that nature is graced by this status of harmony so that the first principles of reality are based on this harmonious existence. And so what we need to do is we need to kind of reclaim, not nostalgically he would say, even though most people would fault him for that, we need to reclaim, if you will, our capacities of reciprocity based on the virtues of that peaceful ontology that grounds um, social existence anyway, which for him is culminating in Christendom, right? Yeah, that idea of graced nature is is key, right? I actually wrote that down to talk about later with the McCarraher piece. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, so given that uh, brief little synopsis, how do you think following Chaz's question here, the idea of Christ fits into your current philosophical project. Oh, the idea of Christ fitting into my current project. 
I mean, I I think I will never I will never escape the theological influences that formed my intellectual capacity. I mean, I wasn't an intellectual type prior to my conversion, you know? So like I learned how to think critically first and foremost because of like systematic theology and because of reading like the Puritans and A.W. Pink and like as much as that can be considered critical thinking from one perspective, you know, critiquing quote unquote secular society, that's the first time that I really started to do intellectual work. So I think that I will never escape that because I kind of just was geared in that direction. And then, of course, I did work on Latin American liberation theology and then even in like PhD research and in my book and stuff like that, I still am working through like concerns about metaphysics and concerns about um like a theological logic right now is my current work, theological logic of finance. And so, you know, those things, you know, my master's supervisor was Philip Goodchild who wrote a book on theology of money. So it's like those things will never escape me. So how does Christ particularly factor? It's really hard to figure, um, to figure how and in what ways, but for certain there will be, there will be like tones of, the Christian tradition and of theology more properly. But I don't know how I can say Christ, like Christ is a liberator or Christ is a revolutionary or Christ is son of God. Like specifically, how do we understand Christ the victorious? I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. What about you? Yeah. You know what? I'm going to kind of miss like um, attack the question from a different way. It kind of seems like no matter what or which path I'm led down academically, intellectually, philosophically, otherwise, you, I've always wanted to have a place to say, in some sense, I can seek justification from like the life of Christ or from the Gospels generally, right? Mm. Um, and that's like hist historically even true, right? Almost every existing you know like macro religion tries to find a way to incorporate the figure of Christ into it as one of its um, saints or holy men or you know teachers or whatever, right? Um, there's something kind of unique and special about that idea of that person that makes you want to seek it out as justification for whatever view you have. Right. There's not a lot of people out there who are like, yeah, and here's why I'm going to use Christ as an example of everything that's wrong <laughs> with a way yeah. of thinking um, or a way of living. So yeah, it's, it's kind of weird that you always seek out the figure of Christ as a justification for a way of living or for a view or a, mm. or a way of criticizing someone else's view. Right. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I wonder if there's something, interesting about that because obviously the figure of Christ gets manipulated and and distorted and twisted in various ways to support all kinds of things. Um, so it, it leaves it kind of ambiguous as to what the actual figure or idea of Christ is in and of itself, if there could be such a thing, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's yeah, one, of the, one of the things that. I've been thinking a lot about is the idea of, you know how in Christianity they make a big deal about the veil being ripped in the temple and that's supposed to signify that no longer are we sequestered from the God's resting place, the most holy place or the holy of holies, right? Now it's like commonized. I think yeah. there's something really interesting that a lot of people don't think about, but that is this is the the opening up of the commons, right? And it's not just the commons in a in an amorphous sense, but it's specifically it's an opening up over the um the semiotic regime of capture that was retained by the Levitical priesthood. That then we could try to say, well, maybe we can think about the opening up, if you will, of the means of symbolic production. So that there's a commoning over the uh, field of symbolic capital or um, the, the regime of semiotic capture has somehow itself been torn down. I mean, I think there's something useful in that, but I don't know how far I would take that idea and run with it. But I mean, you know, maybe like a fun think piece at some point for one of those like – like lefty intellectual, like sojourners magazines or something like that, you know? Yeah, you know what it really sounds like? Because we got to go back to our, like the really beginning point of, of, I think, our love for like academic research and scholarship is new perspective on Paul stuff, dude. Dude, I've been, I've honestly been listening a lot to N.T. Wright lately. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever you think about him, man, those books were formative in terms of making you love Bro. like real historical an academic scholarship. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, I'm still reading through the Old Testament, right? Oh, I mean, reading through the Bible, but I'm reading through the Old Testament. And so it's been really fascinating for me to read through that. And then it makes me want to like 
it makes me want, and I've been looking through my old notes and I read like an old paper that I wrote in my theology of Paul class, which was based on like James Dunn's <laughs> book. And, and it was really interesting. So, you know, I, I do draw a lot from certain sources, like, like forget N.T. Wright as a figure, the new perspective on Paul Dunn, E.P. Sanders, Wright, the Pistis Christu, Bruce McCormack kind of position. Was that his name? Bruce McCormack? Oh no, he's the Bardian. Yeah. Uh, uh, who was the Pistis Christu guy? The, uh, oh God, I can't even remember. Yeah, it's on the tip of my tongue. Richard Hayes? That's the one. That's yeah. the one. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Pistis Christu and all of those debates and things like that. And, and because I still have like family that are evangelical or that are reformed, you know, when they try to talk with me about Christianity, you know, like I can't help but think, I, I can't help but be influenced by the new perspectives um, when I'm in, in, indulging them in talking about theology or, or the Bible or something like that, you know? So um, so I, I probably will still always revisit that literature, you know, even just to kind of like dip my, dip my toes in, like what's going on? Yeah, I think there's still some room for like doing the Jews St. Paul, but more theologically informed. I you agree. Know? Talking about the connection between theology and political theory and stuff, but uh, doing it from mm. a more informed perspective than Bajou did, just kind of only being you know tertiarily uh, connected to Paul. Mm. Yeah, obviously I mean, Bajou didn't have like new perspective stuff in his back pocket. So no, and that's really something. that's really the big problem with most philosophers who engage with theology. You have Zizek who cherry picks, you've got Bedu who just takes like the formal idea of an eventual shift. Um, you get, you know, these various figures who don't really have a deep theological. Now there are some like Agamben who does, and that's why you get people like Adam Kotzko who, you know, I think he did his PhD in theology, but you know, he's also like a rigorous philosopher as well. Right. So, you know, there are people in philosophy of religion and philosophical theology that are doing kind of deep work that have good grasps on theology, but most of them even aren't very biblically literate. Agamben's pretty biblically literate, but most of them aren't biblically literate. I think it'd be really interesting to kind of see how far you can take like biblical theology or like a project like Jose Miranda does when he talks about Marx and the Bible or communism and the Bible to justify, you know, a liberationist position. Like something like that, where it's really rooted in a theological project, maybe a biblical project, but that is just super like experimental or uh, cutting edge philosophically as well. Yeah, I think that flame was was first like um, sparked in us by reading Walter Brueggemann's Prophetic Imagination, right? Dude, I just is listened that, to an interview with him the other day. You're just pulling out all the hits. <laughs> yeah, man. That, that book was, and we've talked about it before in the podcast, I think, was really the introduction to someone who's obviously extremely biblically literate, biblical scholar, but then hints at the sort of political ramifications of um, the biblical texts in a way that we had just never really made connections to before. And obviously, if you care deeply about political and social change and you have you know, strong biblical literacy, that stuff has an obvious connection once it's brought out to you and you see it everywhere. Mm. Yeah. All that to say, Chaz, stay tuned. Get back to us in five years. I'm sure we'll have... But we'll have co-authored uh, either an edited volume or something like that of doing this within the next 10 years. We'll say 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sweet. Um, also, just a quick little reminder. I don't want to delay this housekeeping stuff any longer than we – or I don't want to delay the main segment, I should say, before – you know what I mean. I don't want to waste any more time. We're sponsored by Engine <laughs> Swim. Go to EngineSwim.com. Get 20% off swim gear, athletic gear, goggles, bags, hats, things like that. Engine like – in your car, swim like you should do in the pool if you want to have a rocking body. Uh, EngineSwim.com. <laughs> At checkout, type in OWLS. I believe it's a capital O. Try both, but you'll get 20% off of all your good shit. That's it. Go do it. And also, we want to mention that if you want to support us in more tangible ways, you can always go to Patreon.com slash OWLS Dawn. But you can support us through various tiers and get access to goodies, such as the monthly newsletter, which has extra sticky leaves, shitty minutes, and other stuff as well as bonus episodes and access to voting on our next Patreon poll, which is going on as we speak. So get over there to patreon.com slash owls at dawn if you want access to those things. 
Yeah. All right, now it is time to get into the show. It's time for the first segment, which is the shitty minute. This is where one of us gets to rant and rave about something that's been pissing us off over the last week or days or our entire lifetime, and we just now need to let it go. So, Troy, what is making you all angry inside? Did you watch that show um, on Netflix a couple of years ago, The End of the Fucking World? And, no. Oh, I know. I know the one you're talking about because it was being promoted very heavily and it always popped up in like my recommendeds and I did not. Okay, so uh, just real brief because this isn't super important, but it's a Netflix show called End of the Fucking World. First season came out a couple years ago. Interesting little British show about basically two psychopaths uh, who are teenagers who uh, engage in various hijinks. Um, It's kind of like a black comedy slash thriller of sorts. Um but in that very English tone, you know? Uh, so the first season I thought was great. Second season just came out a couple of months ago. I, I watched it recently on um, various plane rides and uh, didn't like it as much. It wasn't quite as good. I'm, it's the kind of thing where I feel like they just wanted to do a sequel because it was popular and didn't really necessarily need to do it for any reason. But my shitty minute is mm-hmm. in the very first episode of the new season, um, one of the main characters or one of the sort of side characters actually uh, is a philosophy professor and he is portrayed and he's an English philosophy professor. He's portrayed as like this very well to do complete um, narcissistic asshole um, who's completely oblivious to the way he comes off to people. Um, and, and, and worst of all has published a book. It was called like, it's got the most ridiculous title. It was something like it had existentialist in the title. I forget the rest of the name. Um, mm. And then a big old picture of his face on the front. And just to add into the whole like narcissism angle, right? Um, and of course, he has like a giant house and is single and um, gets to, you know, sleep with all of his students and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it made me think, you know, there maybe this is the case with every profession that has sort of a very small group of people. Um, and it's, you know, not like a major profession, like, I don't know, contracting work or nurses or whatever. Um, but why are philosophers p- portrayed so strangely in films? Like, here's the thing. I'm not defending philosophers. Most yeah. philosophers are narcissistic assholes, right? But this is not how it comes across because nobody buys it, <laughs> right? Mm. Like, this guy's actually making it work for him, and that doesn't happen. Like, no one gives a <laughs> shit when you're, like, spending hours and hours um doing like translation work on something that's in that's in Latin. No one gives a shit when you're doing like all this extensive work on critique of dialectical reason, right? No one gives a shit when you're reading through, you know, Rawls' theory of justice for the upteenth time or whatever, trying to parse some sentence. Like all that stuff sometimes makes people go a little bit crazy and be weird and be horrible people. 100% true. But mm. they don't come across as like this accomplished narcissistic asshole, right? They like they portray philosophers in film as if like some idealized notion of like a like a philosophical priesthood where they have actual power over people and convince people to do things um, and can actually woo people into the little inner, inner circle and then um, like like Ayn, Ayn Randian style like you know develop these intellectual circles that then go <laughs> and do all these horrible things or whatever. And it's just this is not at all how philosophers are. And it made me think about the way philosophers are portrayed in different kinds of media. Like, there's that one Woody Allen film. Was it with um, Joaquin Phoenix? Joaquin Phoenix, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't even want to talk about that because fuck that. <laughs> um, but that's obviously has its own little, you know, idiosyncrasies to it. Well, and then and, there's uh, God is Not Dead, where Kevin Sorbo yeah. plays the philosophy professor. <laughs> which is the which is obviously like the worst and the best portrayal. <laughs> Because you almost can't even tell if it's serious, given how ridiculous it is. Like, clearly this person has never been to a philosophy class in their life. Like, the, the student comes in and the professor makes them, what does he do, make them write God is dead on a piece of paper or something? That's right, but the one kid can't do it because he's a Christian. And then, uh, and then the professor says, well, we're going to put God on trial over this semester. You present your evidence and I present mine. And then it turns out that Kevin Sorbo's really just angry at God because his kid was killed or some shit like that. Like his kid and his wife were killed. So he's really just bitter about the problem of evil. And then at the end of his life, I mean at the end of the film, gets hit by a car. And we think he probably has some sort of conversion moment where, you know, because even, even on your deathbed, 
not too late. Which is, you know, part of what, you know, the, the sort of misconception students have when they come into a philosophy classroom is they think, oh, this is the time for us to talk about our opinions, right? And go yeah, back they, and they forth think, They opinions. think it's like, oh, anything goes. There's no truth in it. I've heard this many times from young, like, first years. Or they're like, oh, I, I like philosophy because there's, like, no answer. You know, you can just say whatever. I'm like, well. Mm. Yeah, no, <laughs> that is incorrect. <laughs> and then they get all bummed when it's like we're like working really hard to understand this really complex idea from like Plato's Timaeus, right? Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, it's just it's a complete misconception. Clearly, these people are writing characters that are philosophers, professional philosophers who have never been in a philosophy classroom, or at least they were, you know, maybe high the whole time when they were in it 20 years ago. And it's just like, you know, I get it that probably this happens with almost, I'm sure every physicist just rolls their eyes anytime a physicist is in a TV show, right? The kind of dumb shit they say like, oh, quantum mechanics makes this possible. And it's like, oh my God, really? Um, I'm sure this happens with any sort of specialized field, right? But please, God, writers, just like ask somebody. Like, you for sure know someone who was a philosophy student or major or maybe um, – know someone who teaches philosophy or somehow connected to someone who has been involved in academic philosophy, ask them before you portray these figures in this really ridiculous and weird way. Like as much as physicists, I'm sure have the same, if not a better argument about this, there's no worry about like physics, you know, dying because public conception of it is so bastardized, but the humanities and areas like philosophy are under attack, you know, in, yeah. the, in, in the larger world. And um, people are you know, complaining about the fact that they don't think philosophy has any import into real life. A lot of it, I think, coming from these media conceptions of it. So I think there's some sort of responsibility that people have to portray these things somewhat correctly. Even if you want to lampoon them, there are so many good and accurate ways to lampoon them and to criticize them, right? Philosophers are narcissistic assholes more than the general population, vastly more than the general population, right? Um, but not in this way. And so accurately depicting it i think is there's at least somewhat more of a responsibility to do that with philosophy than maybe like physics so please writers out there just just ask somebody right don't just like fill in the philosophy character in your tv show or movie with some bullshit that's in your head right try and, and do something a little bit more accurate so that you can you know actually have a, a well-rounded character who makes some sense and do responsibility to the discipline of philosophy you know the centuries um, and millennia old discipline, which is the foundation of all other academic expertise as well. They, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of important, just a little bit. Yeah, speaking of uh, the humanities being under attack, the University of Sunderland in the UK just announced a couple of days ago that they're going to be, uh, I, I guess, what would you say, like cutting out, squeezing out funding for and then and then um, like not admitting students to, and then eventually like letting faculty go of their languages, uh, modern languages um, department, their history department, and their politics department. So, I mean, Peace. politics is, is social science, but the others are, um, are in the humanities, you know? And it's, uh, it's brutal. It's, it's one of those like post-92 polytechnic schools that turned into a university and I don't know if you remember, but Middlesex University in like what 2010 or something like that. There was there were all those big protests around the UK trying to yeah. save Middlesex University's philosophy department, which was squeezed out because I can't. The the dean made some or the chancellor, or whoever it was, it was some remark about how there was like no measurable value that they were providing. In other words, there was like no quantifiable metric, even though they were like a very highly rated philosophy department in the UK, like one of the top. Um, just because they have amazing faculty and produce amazing research. Like Peter Halward is there and Peter Osborne and uh, a bunch of others. Um, and they've gone on to other places since then. But that was fucking brutal, you know? Um, so you do see that. So it is under attack. And and I don't understand where a lot of these ideas come from that – I mean I know that there's like – from the business world, there's an attack on things that don't like translate immediately into a job, right? Or at least that on paper don't seem to. But, you know, philosophers, I think you even talked about this with me, I don't know if on the podcast, but students of philosophy, they score very highly in, what is it, like in the uh, standardized tests for graduate exams, right? Yeah, in GRE scores, yeah. GRE scores, and then also on um, like LSATs, right? Yeah, there's, there's literally no argument to be made about um, philosophy not producing uh, jobs. Like 
people with business degrees do, uh, I think, worse overall um, in terms of median income, five and 10 years after graduation, like by any metric, pretty much. Uh, it does not mean um, joblessness or uh, being worse off. But that is also self selection. Like people totally. who are generally intelligent um, are attracted to philosophy, and people who are not just don't aren't going to be interested in that, right? They're going to be interested in other things. And so it's not to say that philosophy makes you you know, well off or anything like that. But it's certainly not a hindrance towards you know, having a, a genuinely well-rounded um, life. But then, you know, they're gonna, that's a threat, right? <laughs> like, yeah. we'll make it so that you can't um, study philosophy and, and uh, like, you know, make enough money to survive. So um, I think some of those things kind of go down the wrong path in terms of justifying philosophy. Like, we need a, a well-rounded defense of intellectual life in general before we start talking about whether philosophy or any other specific discipline um, should be supported in the academy. Because that's just a losing battle, I think. Like, most people don't care about philosophy, and you're not going to be won over by arguing for it specifically. <laughs> yeah, that is true. But yeah, man, you're absolutely right. I always wonder if it's just some, like, disgruntled, like, I don't know, film student that had to take a philosophy unit or something like that, and they fucking hated their professor, and this is just... And then maybe they're not... So they're writing a little bit of their own personal experience, but then they're also just referring to how academic professors have been portrayed in other films. So there's like just this like horizontal textual reference going on. I, I have no clue, but you're absolutely right. It is silly. Or it's also just Sartre's fault because, you know, he's the paragon of like the, the media figure who's also a cultural figure and the philosopher. And uh, everyone thinks that all philosophers are just like that. I mean, they should be. And have crazy eyes and he sleep with everyone. Have, he did have some crazy eyes. <laughs> ah, oh, JP. All right, so should we jump into this main segment? Yeah, let's do it, man. All right, so again, the article reading is from the Hedgehog Review. It's by Eugene McCarraher. It's called We Have Never Been Disenchanted. And I'm taking it that that title, uh, I'm not sure if it appears at all in the book, but it's sort of a riff on Bruno Latour's We Have Never Been Modern, yeah? That is correct. So the idea, what do you think is like the connection there? Like what's McCarraher trying to do with that uh, analogy to Latour? Yeah, so I mean Latour's very simplified uh, purpose in saying We Have Never Been Modern is to dispel the idea that there has ever been a split between nature and culture, which is one of the characteristics let's say of um or at least maybe like the self uh the self um the self images of modernity um that there was this split between nature and culture or between uh like humanity and the conditions out of which humanity emerged but that humans were separate individuals then also are meant to be given some kind of like higher order you know as rational animals or uh as figures with uh the faculty of the understanding for kant or whatever right um liberal subjects whatever uh and so that's the idea is that it's collapsing that duality and i think you get something similar here that with the we have never been in we have never been disenchanted is again trying to dispel one of these like um What's the word I'm looking for? Like self-identified or self-identifying characteristics, maybe, um, which I would say is maybe like a hubristic self-identifying characteristic of certain modern notions from some people, like certain secularists that would say that we are demystified. We no longer believe in the enchanted world. Um, and then other people who kind of bemoan the loss of it, like Charles Taylor in the secular age, you know, we used to kind of have more of this connection with the divine and uh, believe in the beyond in our midst, but now we don't. It's just brute, you know, imminence and materialism. And um, and then there's obviously a Marxist criticism, everything that is solid melts into the air, which is also a title of, uh, I think it's uh, Marshall Berman is his name, the book. So he's kind of trying to, again, attack one of those self-perceived um, notions of progress that I think oftentimes people tack onto 
uh, this phase that is called modernity or, um, you know, the kind of post-enlightenment historical epoch. And I think that's what he's trying to do. He's saying, actually, let's, let's get over this and let's dispel um, the idea that we have actually become disenchanted, that we have freed ourselves. But he's not doing it in the Charles Taylor sense that, um, that he wants to like bemoan the loss of this, but rather he's saying actually what you end up getting is um, we've never been disenchanted and we actually have like a perverted uh, or distorted type of um, piety towards um, a new regime of spirituality or a new regime of enchantment, something along those lines, yeah? Yeah, I think that word dispel you used is, is great, right? Because what McCarrick is doing is kind of like a meta dispelling. It's like a dispelling of the dispelling, right? And saying hmm. there's this there's this myth out there that we've been disenchanted, but it's itself a myth. And so it needs to be disenchanted itself, right? So you're doing like a spell on the spell kind of a thing yeah. or a dispelling on the dispelling in this sense. So, um, and that seems to be the sense of we have never been disenchanted, right? With the two negatives in there is meant to be the kind of meta <laughs> posture that he's taking. So we should probably talk a little bit about what enchantment's supposed to be first before we talk about the myth of disenchantment, yeah? Yeah, that sounds good. So I take it that enchantment is supposed to be sort of a, a extremely abstract and general term about various different cultures, ideologies, and myths, and this idea that in some sense the imminent world as we see it, the world of appearance, the world of our senses, the world that we immediately know, um, is sort of uh, filled with transcendent things that in some sense are beyond that world of appearance, right? It's the sort of separation between world of appearance and the transcendent world or world beyond or whatever, right? And that comes mm -hmm. out in like uh, different animistic religions as being the certain spirits that inhabit objects and places and stuff like that, right? It uh, comes out in like theurgic, really like really ancient theurgic religions where you have to like propitiate gods for um, various, you know, uh, like natural processes just to occur and for your crops to be saved and shit like that, right? For cows not to die. Mm -hmm. um, and then it comes across, I think, or would argue in various Eastern religions in similar ways in terms of like animism and various gods. And it comes out in um, Plato in like this transcendent world, right? And like ancient Greek philosophy, the various. Uh, for like fertility cults for um, the you know Greek cult religions comes out in Christianity um, in a kind of unique and different way, but you still have like saints and holy places and sacraments, which are sacraments being kind of like the key moment of like transcendence um, and imminence, right? So it's supposed to be the sense that like the whole world for much of its history where human beings have existed, where like cultures have existed cultures have been enchanted in some way. So they share this enchantment across various times and places, right? Mm. Yeah. Can I just read a quick little thing that he says? Um, he says that uh, the idea is that the earth was suffused and enveloped by, quote, enchantment, an invisible universe of spirits and deities who inhabited the natural world and could shape the course of human affairs. These spirits animated objects, dwelled in mountains or forests, and delivered messages through dreams, oracles, and prophets. Whether they were capricious or governed by providential design, these forces could be mastered or entreated through practices of magic, divination, and prayer. And then he kind of goes on for there. But that's the idea, is that there was a world of magic and sacramental forces. That's the world of enchantment that supposedly existed in the pre-modern epoch. Yeah? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, so Did you... Like, I... I it kind of fits, but like I remember it was really popular to simply like divide up Western history into like pre modern, modern, and post modern. Um, and pre modern was the time when you have like, let's say, the enchanted world, enchanted reality, a sort of like suffusion, if you will, between the transcendent and the material. And then you have the modern where it's like a split, right? And no longer is the transcendent involved, and you kind of just have a world that is disenchanted. And then you have the postmodern world where, I mean, whatever, like maybe there's some sort of skepticism to the uh, supremacy of modernity and new age religion comes back in. And so you kind of have like this pseudo spirituality or a type of re-enchantment, right? So you go from enchantment to disenchantment to re-enchantment. And that was kind of a way that I had uh, a long time ago that I, I know that a lot of people talked about um, a way to categorize uh, history. 
Yeah, you could also cast it as, you know, the pre-modern being about the enchanted world, the modern being about the skepticism towards the enchanted world, the introduction of disenchantment, right? But the idea being we can make progress um, through disenchanting the world. Um, and then the postmodern being a skepticism of just that latter point. We're still disenchanted, mm. but we don't have any guarantee of progress. And so we're kind of left with no actionable policy. Um, That's like follow. the Nietzschean, the Nietzschean line, right? Yeah. 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 So there's, there's different ways to cast it. Right. Um, and there's probably, I mean, there's certainly an argument to be made here that this is way, way too um, simplistic to sort of catch all the various differences between, you know, if we're talking about pre-modern, we're talking about 99% of human history <laughs> here, <laughs> all kind of cashed out as being one kind of thing, which is obviously going to be problematic in various ways. But let's just kind of work with with the frame here and see what McCara is going to do with it. So cool. if that's what enchantment is, right? And disenchantment is supposed to happen, according to McCarrick, according to his timeline, earlier than what you might think, right? Usually it's, it's cast as like being an enlightenment project of disenchanting, right? And maybe beginning in like the scientific revolution, seeds of it, and then the enlightenment being sort of the no holds barred disenchanting of one place and then the next until, you know, the whole thing is, is fully disenchanted. McCarrick claimed that the Protestant Reformation is mm. really the beginning of this, which I think is kind of interesting. So mentioned before that from McCarraher, Christianity allows this enchantment to continue um, in forms of like sacraments and holy places and saints and stuff like that, right? So there's still this enchantment that's going on, although it's different than like that kind of animistic kind of where it's entirely ubiquitous. Um, but then the Protestant Reformation relegates all those things to sort of private belief, right? It's the individual and God, and they are in a one-to-one -one relationship. And there's no need for intercession of saints. And there's no need for intercession of holy places. And the sacraments are purely symbolic um, and are not enchanted in any way. And so he thinks the Protestant Reformation really introduces this kind of individualistic, disenchanted world, even though it's still, you know, obviously nominally Christian and, you know, non-secular, and introduces this space for the, the kind of so-called secular by making um, this split between private belief and then sort of public life and uh, the public context that you exist in, which is now disenchanted. Mm. Yeah, I, I kind of really like this idea that, like, you know, every every philosopher, every theologian, every thinker that is going to make a bold claim has to have the bad guy, right? Like, to go back to Milbank, the bad guy is Scotus. Dun Scotus. <laughs> That's right. He's the bad guy, right? Um, I like I how the bad... I still want that HBO drama with Dun Scotus. It's like the old <laughs> villain. I mean, I love how the bad guy here is Luther. And I'm picturing the film Luther. That's... Uh, <laughs> Did you ever see the film with, with Ralph Fiennes? With uh, not Ra not Ray Fiennes, his brother Joseph Fiennes. Oh, okay. Whoever. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but I'm picturing that right. Like that's the bad guy, and I like it because it's kind of making me think that you have this angry and despondent and like dissatisfied and maybe guilty and insular figure that initiated the trajectory that we then kind of like have that culminates in Weber's The Protestant Work Ethic, which is kind of the trajectory, right, that, that McCarraher follows. He goes to that Weberian notion of disenchantment, right? Um, and I, I kind of like it. I think rhetorically, if for no other reason, rhetorically, it's kind of fun. But I do think there's something interesting here. And I think the shift is this, again, to kind of go back to what we were talking about earlier, nature being graced. I think what you get with Catholicism and the sacramental ontology of the actual sacraments and of the veneration of the saints um, is you have a participatory ontology. You have an ontology where literally there is a chain of being and God is not God. Let's not get so bogged down in thinking of God in terms of like, um, like a theistic personalism, like, like a psychological being like just a really big Zeus or something like that. But that the being of being, maybe, to use Heideggerian language, which I think McCarrick is very influenced by this type of poetic, um, uh, this type of poetic metaphysic, 
uh, that, that the ground of being is always infused into all of its various modes or iterations or instantiations, right? So the flower speaks of the glory of God in a very literal sense, which is biblical, but the Protestant Reformation comes along and it really cuts itself off from that sacramental position because of its emphasis on covenant, right? And so the relationship becomes contractual, it becomes voluntaristic, right? It's God's will from eternity past that things mm -hmm. happened. And so that cuts things off from the metaphysical realism. It becomes a kind of, um, it, it, it becomes more dualistic metaphysically rather than neoplatonic, right? And I think that's kind of one of the things that's really going on here, no? Yeah, and I certainly appreciate um, sort of locating the, the beginning point within the the christian context right because it's it's it almost like i mean i, I don't know if this is necessarily true but it seems like the enlightenment is often cast in these terms with, when it's cast as like a secular project right um as being sort of against religion and the popular imagination is kind of like oh well, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a more enlightenment type thinker right I, I don't believe in like religious mysticism and stuff and it's like well have you read the enlightenment thinkers like the great enlightenment thinker is Kant, and he like spends a hell of a lot of time trying to justify Christianity. And in fact, <laughs> even explicitly says he's making room for Christianity in his philosophy, right? By allowing there to be all this stuff we can't know um, through theoretical reason. So, like, yeah, you kind of have to, in some sense, allow for this the beginning point of this uh, like secular turn or whatever this disenchanted disenchantment to be within religion itself, like within Christianity itself. Or you're you're missing some point um, about how about the sort of dialectical progress or dialectical like you know m move that happens here by just beginning like well, one day someone woke up and said well what if all this what if all this like enchantment stuff is just like woo mm, right 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 I mean the problem though is that can you really just blame the Protestant Reformation like is it that easy to just blame like a singular moment as as a clean break, that there was some sort of, I don't know, like epistemological, ontological, whatever, shift that all of a sudden one person initiated. I just don't think that's the way that history works. I think that things persist and they insist. And so, I mean, you know, get other people that try to, 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 to say that capitalism started and all of this, this demystification stuff started with double entry bookkeeping. Because once you have double entry bookkeeping, then you have balance sheets and you have ledgers and that it's that. And then you have like McLuhan that is like, oh no, it's the alphabetization. Um, so it's it's once you start making like things in a in a in an external relation to each other through the alphabet or alphabet or something like that, that leads to certain problems. I mean, they're making different arguments with different conclusions towards different ends, but I'm just not so sure that it's easy to say that that is like the definitive starting point, right? That that was the moment of mystification. But rhetorically. I'm here for it. Yeah, I know we talk a lot on the podcast about how if you just have this notion of reducing the ideological to the material or vice versa, you're missing out on a really important frame for understanding historical change, right? And so you have to consider the sort of interconnections and the, the dual causal connections between the two. And then pr problematize the very idea of the separation between the material and the ideological, right? Um, and so I think McCarriher does a, a, a fairly good job of introducing both, right? There's both the sense in yeah. which ideologically the Protestant Reformation you know, sets up and presages this um, disenchantment turn, but then also the you know, beginnings of capitalism are around the similar time um, yeah. and the opportunities for exploitation of nature come. And so the ideas that allow you to think of nature as being kind of this dead thing which can be exploited are all of a sudden really, really um, helpful. <laughs> right towards justifying and producing arguments for why it's okay now to exploit uh, nature and then take its its bounty um, to produce more wealth for yourself and for human beings. And so um, it's sort of the confluence of the two things, which end up you know it's, it's a it's a nice and happy marriage of the two at similar times that ends up making capitalism the sort of over you know overwhelming ideology of of the age of mm. disenchantment. Mm. I mean, I think he does focus more on like the Weberian ideas rather than like, if we're going to use the base superstructure stuff, the kind of Marxian mode of production as being the prime cause, don't you think? Because his concern is, is that there's like what he keeps calling a pecuniary reason and that that's like the metaphysic, if you will, um, that characterizes capitalism. Um, so it's when you start thinking that when you start speaking in that kind of language, when you're speaking about 
like the reason, the logic, um, the rationality of the capitalist system, you seem, at least to me, to be kind of giving priority. Maybe not, not like an idealist, like a like a like an ignorant idealist priority, but you are giving some sort of priority to reason, rationality, ideas, metaphysics. That there's some sort of like metaphysical commitments that that at least um, ground people in and not just justify people in their um, their position here? No? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. But I, I guess maybe I'm being a bit more forgiving because the genre of this is history of ideas, right? Oh, yeah. Um, Good point. So, Good point. like, yeah. he's going to come at it from that guy's given the genre, right? But then mm -hmm. there's at least – because, you know, sometimes the history of ideas text can be just – so blunt in this like ideas are the only thing that creates change in the world right and it's just so obnoxious i think and it, it was especially i think but think back in like the mid-century that the history of ideas as a as a genre you know produced by like um what's his name uh lovejoy who wrote great chain of being um becomes this like uh new way of, of thinking about history purely through the evolution of ideas and i think that's just it mm. can be really bad <laughs> at certain points um, and so at least maybe he's he's correcting that a little bit by talking about spending a lot of time in this little essay here talking about uh, you know Marx's criticism um, mm. of religion yeah. and, and account of disenchantment and that that at least introduces the idea of you know the material's effect on on ideology. Yeah, I really like this because I think we talked about this quite a bit with uh, G. A. Cohen and Cohen's treatment of Marx's opium passage. But I mm -hmm. really like this. Most people just blandly kind of toe this materialist line when they are doing work on Marx. But the title of the section actually where uh, McCarraher starts to engage with Marx is actually called The Fetishized World. So he spends a lot of time thinking about the effects of ideology or uh, commodity fetishism or mystification that Marx still wants to pay a lot of attention to with regards to describing capitalism. Now, Marx ultimately wants to say that that's a bourgeois illusion, right, that entraps people, that induces people into the valorization process, that that's one of the ways that capital as the subject of history, if I'm going to use Postone's formulation of it rather than the kind of Leninist uh, – proletariat being the subject of history, but the idea of capital being the subject of history, that it kind of like induces people um, into this process through mystification, through commodity fetishism, which then creates that alienated and um, that mystified sense of subjectivity that capital subjects, that, that labor under capital um, are defined by. And I think that's really important to understand. You know, I think that because it isn't just a comment here and there. It's something that exists from Marx's writings in the 40s all the way up through to the end in the in the 70s, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. Um, and so so McCarraher introduces sort of Marx's disenchantment here as, as one he's going to kind of contrast himself with, right? So Marx also critiques the idea of, of disenchantment, um, not in those terms necessarily that I, that I remember, but... Uh, Marx says, and here's a quote from the from the text here: "Like the fetishes of tribal peoples, money confers extraordinary powers once believed to belong to shamans, priests, and gods." There's mm -hmm. a connection there between the objects of enchantment, right? Shamans, priests, and gods are the subjects of enchantment as well, and the sort of formal place that money plays in capitalism, right? It also has is this like locus of enchantment, um, and so then McCarraher kind of introduces. The ideas of the commodity fetishism that you were talking about and uh, the distinction between use value and exchange value in the market and the sacramental power that capitalism takes for itself, right? And, and using this sort of uh, exchange value, it's this kind of mystical site of um, – it's like a transcendence that uh, governs our actions and in some way we have to you know, prostrate before of. Um, and so yeah. the idea – Well, it's almost – it, it, I mean this is very much – Marx is kind of like going back to Marx's indebtedness to Feuerbach, right? But instead of it being God, that is like the reversal of reality that it, that we project and then we subsume ourselves underneath, it's money, 
right? That money is this hidden abode of these contradictions that we don't realize the processes, the power relations, the uh, production of value relations underneath. We don't understand the mode of production, the relations of production. Um, and But nevertheless, we are kind of the creators of them. The, the capitalist system is this large, complex thing that's hidden over. But nevertheless, then we kind of like... Uh, subsume ourselves under, if you will, the call of money that induces us back into the production process. So it's kind of a, a, a Feuerbachianism uh, that still exists, even in capital for Marx. Yeah, I like that. And it's also, you know, you mentioned the, the sort of hidden side of contradictions. It has to stay hidden, right? There has to be this sort of mysterious element to it. In the yeah, Marx that, calls uh, it the hidden abode. I love that. Right? Yeah, and it, it's it's very much has that air of the enchantment, right? Where there's this world of gods, but you can't really see them, and you're not really sure how it works, but you kind of have to work within the system, otherwise you're screwed, right? Um, yeah. So it has that same like similar formal aspects um, as mm. the like religious form of enchantment did. Mm. That you see, but it becomes pretty obvious the the connections there between uh, enchantment and commodity fetishism. Totally, yeah, totally, totally. But then McCarraher's issue is that while Marxism or this Marxist critique explains in similar um, ways that we have never been disenchanted in our capitalism, right? Capitalism has its own kind of enchantment through money, even if it sort of eradicates uh, the gods and all that solid melts into air and that stuff. Um, the capitalist form of enchantment seems impossible to eradicate, he thinks, in the end, right? Especially since sort of the, um, what was the metaphor G.A. Cohen used? The obstetric metaphor, right? Yeah. Where history is just going to birth Right, revolution and and communism, and that capitalism right. will end just naturally by natural processes, which then sort of, means for Marx that supposedly maybe enchantment will end, right? And yeah, naturally, it's just it's going to go yeah. through its its period of, of real disenchantment is coming, right? It just hasn't happened yet. Capitalism That's right. has its own kind of enchantment, yeah. Um, and so the problem with that, McCarroher thinks, is especially now that we've seen that those the obstetric metaphor was a failure and that those natural processes, those natural ideological processes didn't really happen. Um, we have this ubiquity of media and consumer culture and the welfare state and capital's control of labor and all these things make it seem like capitalist enchantment is just ineradicable. Hmm. This is just yeah. the dominant form of imagination and there isn't much we can do about it. And if Marx was wrong and the sort of the natural ideological process wasn't to evolve into the future eventual disenchantment or salvation through disenchantment, then we're just stuck with this kind of enchantment, which seems mystifying and immiserating and has, you know, all the, the downsides of the pre-modern enchantment in terms of being mystifying and, and you're, and you're ignorant of the actual, the actual processes of the world. And then adds on to it, like, incredible immiseration and destruction of like nature right so it's like a, it's a yeah. compounding the bad things about about enchantment i mean dude i just read an article the other day about smart cities being like new gods and this literate the literature that is drawing on this language of enchantment is is i don't know if it's making a comeback like i don't know if it disappeared but it's very prominent you know hmm. um i was in a seminar actually a few months ago and there was a person giving a, a, a really um, well-known academic was giving a talk. And I can't remember. We got into a, a little bit of a discussion. And I mentioned something about like a theological logic that seems like it's going on here. Da, 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 da. And she said, well, like kind of just dismissing me. She said something along the lines of, you know, well, we just live in a secular world. So I don't think that that exists. And I was trying to make a point that I, I feel like there's like this unconscious or unacknowledged persistence of enchantment. And she was kind of just like, no, 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 it's not the case. And I thought that was really interesting. And I've, and I've, ever since then, I've been really sensitive to paying attention to how people talk about things in articles, uh, whether it's like Jacobin or Guardian, or if it's like New York Times opinion, or whether it's an interview on the news, or even if it's uh, like an academic book or something like that. And I have actually started to see that, that yeah, sure, there are some people who, who don't, you know, just pay, pay attention to it just because like, it's not like maybe they're even intentionally trying to speak the language of disenchantment. They just kind of just do like secularity persists. Right. But it seems that there is this real resurgent concern, especially with like thinking about digit digital technology and like financial algorithms and pricing mechanisms and um, like 
the Fed being the lender of last resort or like uh, the the assurance of um, global liquidity, you know, things like that where it's like these are kind of like godlike figures. And there's almost like a religious critique that people are trying to level or that they're trying to draw from again. Unfortunately, I just think a lot of times their critiques are very shallow because it's basically coming out of the, well, we should just be good modern secularists, but no, we're giving over our power to these new gods kind of thing. Like we're mystifying ourselves. It's kind of how they, the general tenor, but it is interesting, at least the language of enchantment seems to be pretty prominent. And, and I, 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 I don't know if I can say this except anecdotally, but it seems to be more prominent over the past couple of years from what I can remember. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I, I've thought a lot about this as, you know, becoming more invested in analytic philosophy. And there's definitely this, this strain of like, um, not only are we going to sort of divorce ourselves from theological thinking, but even from the vast majority of philosophical thinking throughout history because of its sort of dedication to these different kinds of enchantments in some way, right? And transcendence. And we just can't oh, do the kind of analytic philosophy we want to do um, unless we just kind of bracket those things, right? Remove them and just kind of assume they don't have any role, even if we're maybe open to like in our personal lives being okay with stuff like that or, in, you know, in like poetry or in our aesthetic disciplines being into that kind of a thing. And it seems like there's kind of a a price you pay here with the modern or the contemporary division of academic labor. Like there's a certain very narrow way you have to do this sort of academic discipline and you just can't allow other disciplines to come in and affect it in any way. And yet that's not how thought works, right? Mm. Thought is enmeshed in all these messy and dirty ways. And so there is theological thinking that's invested in every other form of thinking and every other form of thinking into the theolo uh, theological thinking. Right. And um, everything's kind of, you know, enmeshed together in this way. And we just, we want to do academic work without that in mind. So I imagine when, when you bring up like the, the genealogical origins of some, um, contemporary idea in some sort of, you know, theological, uh, uh, guys, right. That the person, maybe they're even open to the idea that, yeah, that's probably true, but they just don't do with it. Like, how, how am I supposed to work with that? How do I respond to that in a way that, I've been trained to respond to uh, criticisms, not negative criticisms, just, you know, just criticism in the sense of analysis, right? Mm. Um, I don't, just don't know what to do with that. Like, wh what am I supposed to say? Okay, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I told you, I told you I was in a seminar once and I just used the word metaphysics and it was a social science crew. And I swear they looked at me like I was a fucking five headed monster, man, because I was talking about metaphysics because there is just a restriction for, like a particular type of there's like a methodological restriction within the social sciences that that don't engage with metaphysical speculation they don't engage with certain philosophical ideas you know it's much more empirically driven so when you start speaking in that language it's like like you just said i don't know what to do with that you know yeah there's a there's a border there's a state border here and <laughs> you ain't got the documents right so yeah it, it's more just even if someone's, some people just dismiss it and say it's hooey, right? But I think more, you know, like reflective people will be like, yeah, that's probably an important area to think about. Leave it to the interdisciplinary folks, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with that. There's nothing I can do with that given my training, right? It's like handing a hammer to a, you know, to a, like a medical doctor. Like, okay, what am I supposed to do with this? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it's it's part of the the, to the negative side of the you know, really narrow division of academic labor that we've produced in the academy today mm. yeah it's unfortunate um because you gotta well, have I'd, all the tools i'd much the rather tools. have hegel talking about the size of people's skulls that's so much better <laughs> yes yes definitely um god i just had a flashback to that fucking that subreddit whatever it was relationships one where it was the supposed physicist talking about oh my hegel. god <laughs> sorry <laughs> That's uh, real interdisciplinary work right there. <laughs> said, uh, Jesus, marry somebody from a different discipline. Uh, <laughs> gosh. But yeah, so, okay, so Makara her comes in. He likes that Marx uh, is engaging with capitalism as still being um, enchanted. Uh, but what he doesn't like is Marx's way out of it, right? right. And yeah. so what he develops is what he calls a sacramental critique or like a romantic critique. Well, really capitalism. quick, as you were saying, Marx's way out of it being 
we do want to get disenchanted. We just we haven't want, gotten yeah, there yet. Exactly it. Yeah, that 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 language of progress. And then in the book, McCarraher is very he he's very repetitive on certain themes. One of which is the dominance of I mentioned it earlier, what he calls pecuniary reason. Um, that that is like the metaphysical foundation of capitalism. Um, one is the myth of secularity, and then another thing that comes up is this constant, um, this constant urge towards technological progress. And so that tendency is something that he finds to be problematic, and that he thinks is um, part of the pecuniary logic that he identifies with capitalism but that also persists even in marx and so that marx himself doesn't marx and marxism doesn't get out of their way and doesn't get out of his way and it doesn't the, the discourse itself doesn't get out of its way enough because it's still tied to a type of um, logic of progress and technological reason even if it doesn't have the pecuniary metaphysics as much it's still held back by that that modern narrative yeah, I mean, he explicitly says that for Marx, still, it's like rapacious growth yep, that will eventually exactly. produce um, abundance that's then, you know, shared in the you know, future communist utopia. And so it's still dependent on that pecuniary reason, even if not in the same way that the capitalist enchantment is. And, yeah, because and, you know, capital I've, accumulation is required for yeah. the next stage of socialism. Yeah, so the, that uh, accumulation is a necessary and eventually sufficient condition. Like in like the vulgar kind of Marxism, right? Uh, for producing communism, and then like the later kinds of more pessimistic Marxism, right? Those who don't think that it, you know revolution is like automatically going to happen um, through the necessary like, progress of history, it's still a necessary condition that this, this accumulation occurs, even if it's not yeah. sufficient for producing um, the utopia. So you still have that logic there, even when it's slightly deflated. And yeah. you know, you mentioned that. Um, McCarrick is criticizing Marx for the sort of relying upon this notion of progress. And it's also just the notion of progress through disenchantment, right? That's the key. Like disenchantment will produce the progress or it's in some way a condition and a ground for the kind of progress. And that's the, I think the logic that McCarrick is criticizing, right? He thinks that yeah. um, we need a new kind of enchantment, not this sort of reliance upon disenchantment as the condition for progress. Yeah, it becomes a metaphysical a priori for Marx, doesn't it? It is – the hope is that we will get out of that. So the end, the telos, actually then does become an a priori. So as much as people want to try to say that we can be non-teleological Marxists, there's still a metaphysical presupposition of getting out of the cycle, which is projected forward into the future, that then is supposed to like pull us forward, right? So that's really interesting because it is – at a metaphysical basis um, that you can also level a critique against like Marxism as having a particular ideology of which is of which it is unaware being the metaphysics of disenchantment that we just haven't quite gotten to yet but we can get there um, if we just realize that which is possible and then of course I would use Deleuze here and I would talk about the very problem uh, of you know realizing the possible anyway right because I mean it wasn't it Barber that talks about it, or maybe it's just in my other Deleuze readings I can't remember because he talks about this in difference and repetition but um, the idea that if you kind of just uh, seek the realization of the possible the only thing you're really adding to it is existence but it doesn't actually produce anything novel you're just reproducing the images that you've projected beforehand right as that's what that's what you think McCarr something similar to what McCarr is criticizing uh, Marxism for doing maybe yeah yeah that it still has that metaphysical restrict restriction to it yeah i can see that yeah, interesting so mccarraher's solution this is like we are talking about some like you know evaluative content here uh and i imagine this is like your favorite part because it uses your favorite word <laughs> imagination um <laughs> mccarraher wants to um sort of you know agree with sort of you know half of the marxism diagnosis but then have a different solution right being he thinks he calls it like sacramental imagination is that the same word he uses the same term he uses in the book yeah many times yeah so sacramental imagination so it's going back to this idea there's both a, a looking backwards and a looking forwards right but looking backwards is look at this idea of sacraments um and a, a sacramental kind of ontology right looking at what kind of objects sacraments are well in sacraments you have a transcendence that's within imminence right it's a kind of enchantment of imminent things right in that 
um, you're not sort of placing the enchantment on the dead set a group of atoms, right? No, the the actual object itself carries like its full meaning in its like enchantedness, right? So the sacrament yeah. isn't just like um and the way we typically think about it, where like a like a um a dead object is like has a wand placed on it and now it's magical. No, it's like inherently magical in some sense, right? It's full meaning and it's talos in like an Aristotelian sense, right? It's like its end goal is um to be connected to to the divine, um, and to have this sort of um, quasi enchanted element about it. So there is no dichotomy, dichotomy, excuse me, ultimately between sacred and profane in this way. It sort of um, breaks down that boundary. And McCarroher thinks Marxism, Marxism's mistake is that it's not that's too materialist, right? That it's like too reductive um, and making. Uh, everything just about the material, but he thinks he calls it not being materialist enough. This is like the most Zizekian move you could make. Right? Yeah. Um, not seeing the sort of sacramental character of material things, the transcendence in the imminence rather than sort of beyond it. Yeah, I really like this. So Sartre uses, I mean, it's not, it's a Hegelian idea, but Sartre uses this term called the singular universal. And I think I've talked about it before, but like I'm holding a pen in my hand right now. And Sartre's idea is that the entire history of the world is contained in this pen. So, like, in a very simple sense, we could say that the entire history of writing can be referred to the entire history of metal manufacturing because it's got metal products. And so then we can think about steel mills and then we can think about uh, international trade relations. And it's also got plastics. So then we can think about the development of plastics and then we can think about... Um, like oil refineries, because that goes into making plastics eventually, right? And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you talk about writing, then you talk about writing certain books, and then you can start talking about literature. The entire history of the world is contained in this pen. It is a singular universal. It is a singular object that contains the universal within it, or at least expresses the universal. Or the universal is um, insistent within it, right? And I think there's something interesting here as well, because... It, so whenever people start thinking about like a sacramental ontology or, um, you know, when they start thinking about like the beyond in our midst, it's really easy to just go to like that woo-woo kind of thing that you were talking about earlier, you know? And you start thinking about God and then you start thinking about like monotheistic psychological types of gods. Um, David Bentley Hart refers to uh, it as polymonotheism. And basically he just <laughs> means that it's like taking like the – the old polytheistic gods like Zeus, but then you just inflate that to the status of, of one god. Um, it's just like this, in, it's a very Feuerbachian thing, this inversion of the best uh, qualities of human characteristics inflated into like a bigger person. Um, and you just like negate negate the uh, limitations or whatever. Um, so it's not finite, it's infinite. Um, and, uh, and so I think a lot of people think that that just that that's what's there when you start talking about like a sacramental ontology. But I think you can have a really robust like monism. I think you could even be like uh, a Deleuzian immanentist. I think you could be a quote unquote materialist and still advocate for a sacramental ontology without going the woo woo route and throwing your hands in the air of just like a pure mystified type of romanticism where you just sit there in silence and say, well, it's just God. It's the mysterious. It's the beyond. There are no explanations for it. I think you can still rigorously engage in like speculative metaphysics while also perpetually, processually trying to articulate and understand and comprehend the essence of or the properties of or the effects of that more than that insists in the singular um, activity or the, the singular entity, I mean. And so that your sacramental ontology then is opening you up simply to that endless process that doesn't need to just go to like, like, I don't know, the, the I'm thinking of like the Protestant idea of like the secret things belong to the Lord. You don't need to go that route with this. Yeah, so this is part of my issue and I kind of wanted to talk this out with you and get your thought on this. So at least the way he introduces it in this little essay, this idea of sacramental or sacral ontology it seems like it's basically just saying look the sort of materialist like productive materialist account where everything is just dead matter like it's pushed around like a machine um is wanting as an account of 
of nature, right? So anything that's le- that's like not as reductive as that is in some sense enchanted. It kind of seems like, right? Like yeah. anything that introduces more than that is in some sense enchanted. If if disenchantment just means this account of like dead matter, I guess moved around like, like billiard balls ontology, right? Um, and so at that point, it seems like you have so many roads you can go down. Like you can go down um, like the, like a Millbank type road, like we are talking about earlier, um, like the Grace Nature route, where you like have a really specific kind of Christianized version of ontology and really of any um, physical or social theory. At that well, point, I right? think he does. The ground of it. Yeah, I think he, he does, he, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, and he does have it somewhat down that road, right? But yeah. what stops like Aristotelian teleology from being going down this road also? Like if if sort of the telos of an object is sort of within it, right? It's one of its four causes, right? Is its end goal. Um, why isn't that a kind of enchantment? Like, it kind of seems like it is. Mm. So if all this is saying is that disenchantment is wrong, and I agree with that, billiard balls ontology is incorrect. Like it's just not a good mm. metaphysical account. Um, then why does like rejecting that? I mean, we give us any clue as to what the solution is as far as a better ontology. It seems like every other ontology is on the table at that point. Yeah, he does kind of make a decision, right? Like a philosophical decision to say that um, the way to ground this sacramental ontology that he's developing is explicitly uh, Catholic. And he quotes Pope Francis at the end, Mm -hmm. and... Um, I don't think that that's incidental, right? I think that that is necessary to his argument. Um, one of the things he also talks about is he draws from uh, the Romantic poets and he draws from the arts and crafts tradition and he draws from like guys like uh, Romantic socialists like William Morris. And one of the things that unites all of them for McCarraher is this appeal to the ground of divine love or just love in general as being this kind of like excessive binding, I'm going to say a priori category. And I, I find that to be really interesting because the way that he talks about love is very harmonious, right? There's no there's no passion and lack. This isn't like the love of Hegel here, right? This isn't Lacan's uh, desire here. This is a very kind of harmonious, peaceful reinstitution of cosmos, bringing the world to rights type of language, which is explicitly Christian. And I think it ultimately is very – I actually when – I, when I first started reading the book, I was like, this reminds me of Milbank. I looked to see if he quotes Milbank at all, and he doesn't because I still get this ontology of peace sense from him that, that ultimately what grounds the um, sacramental imagination is that the imagination is able to attest to, to get beyond – the um, variations and differences and conflictualities and get to that which is more than, which is the binding persistence and presence of love and beauty, the source of creation, the fountain, right? The being of being, that it's there. We just need to attune ourselves to it. And I think that's what his project ultimately is. Now, he's a historian. He's not a philosopher. So he's trying to kind of create um, a narrative that allows us to maybe – they can kind of like open us up, but but I still think that that's what his philosophical foundation is, or maybe we should say his theological foundation is. Yeah, yeah, and I think you have a different guises of it, right? Like the the sort of unfortunate false dichotomy is very clear, I think, in like Milbank and and maybe in David Bentley Hart too, where you have it's either like Christianity is dominant over everything, like a new Christendom, or it's just full nihilism, right? It's one or the other. Uh, McCarraher seems like he's probably going to be a little bit more gentle than that, a little bit more circumspect than that, right? Um, but still, it seems like you have this notion of, look, uh, like, reductive materialism is wrong, so therefore we should be Catholic. And it's like, well, are you sure? <laughs> like, I'm not sure what the justification is for that, because it seems like, like, okay, I think we both agree, and we make a point about this a lot, that every normative account is going to have metaphysical underpinnings, right? If right. you ignore it, then you have a bad metaphysical underpinning, most likely, because you're not reflective about it, right? Right. But that does not mean that your metaphysical underpinning determines the normative content, right? 
doing the metaphysics doesn't just tell you, it doesn't just fall out a like political theory and an ethical theory. It doesn't fall out of your metaphysics. Like it's not, that's again mm-hmm. like a kind of obstetric metaphor. Or if I just do the metaphysics, I'll birth out some like normative political theory which will tell me how we're supposed to live. And I just like Which is a very do- Mil- Milbankian project, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And I yeah. think that's just it's a very kind of, you know, um platonic and Aristotelian way of like viewing things, right? Um yeah. which I mean, I, I'm, I'm not even sure that's even true, but uh, it just seems like you know, you've got to do like a much more work of justification here. Like, I, I don't see how this solution just falls out of the sort of metaphysical critique that you've been doing. Yes, reductive materialism is incorrect, right? And it has all these uh, problems and issues that you've cataloged, right? Um, so you can sort of trace, do a genealogical account of the normative and political theory and see its metaphysical problems. Right, you can diagnose it in that way. Diagnose right. the metaphysical problems via the political um, issues at the at the surface, but that I don't think that means you can do the reverse, where you can just do the metaphysics, and as long as you do that right, the normative content is going to fall out. I don't think that's true. Hmm. Yeah, it, he's kind of doing a genealogical critique, but then rather than just leave you with like a nihilism, he's like pulling the rabbit out of the hat and it's like see all along we've been christian because he says this in the book i can't remember if he says it as much in the article um but he talks about oh he does yeah how it's a sort of distorted enchantment it's not that we are disenchanted but it's rather a type of um he uses a particular word i can't remember it's not perverse but it's um oh it's a misenchantment is what he calls it so the idea is is that we have somehow violated the metaphysical laws and that capitalism is actually misenchantment it's still enchantment but it's almost like the enchantment of the devil right it's not the city of god and because it enchants and then hides the fact that it's enchanting right it makes you believe that you're not being you're not enchanted when it actually is which right. is really ironic and interesting, isn't it? I like that. He says that right here in the final paragraph. I was just going to mention this. He says, No doubt this will all seem foolish to the shamans and magicians of neoliberal capitalism whose own imaginations are lavishly imprisoned in the gaudy cage of disenchantment. I love, first of all, he's a great writer. Um, but yeah. their imaginations are imprisoned in the gaudy cage of disenchantment. So th- it's almost like they're mystified in their disenchantment. They're they're misenchanted in their disenchantment, right? Yeah, dis- disenchantment's a kind of enchantment. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's a perverse but kind because it's deceptive. Right? It is per- for him. It is perverse. It is, it is perverse because it is a distortion of the true. And I think he would say that of the true enchantment that is there in the sacramental ontology of divine love or something along those lines that the romantics get at. You know, that's why he talks about Wordsworth and William Blake and that they get at it, right? That they at least understand the eternity that is in your, that is in your second or, you know, whatever, whatever the quote is by, by William Blake, right? Yeah. So what do you think about that? His, it's kind of strange to me. I think it seems to go back to the romantics as being like this uh, harbinger of like what, christianized enchantment would look like but i thought you might like that so what do you think the connection was for him because this isn't a thing necessarily that some of the uh, more like great nature people would go towards i would think yeah no this it's interesting that that's what i haven't gotten to the final portion of the book but this is like this is like his um the prestige right for the three acts of the magic show oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the, the prestige for him is that's what he does is he kind of says okay so we've never been disenchanted and then he goes through like this entire history of uh, of American enchantment from like the Great Revival and Jonathan Edwards and then like Wilsonian imperialism and then like branding and public relations and all of this stuff and and um, Taylorism and how all of this – and he, he paints a really nice narrative how all of this is just an expression of a misenchantment, right? That it's not disenchanted and, and sometimes it's very explicit where you get – you know. You know, leading economists or leading uh, corporate managers that are using very kind of theological or theistic or spiritual language. Um, and then he kind of goes to Marx and he's like, oh, and it's similar kind of argument here, but he stretches it out. 
And then he talks about, like, you know, the anarchists and stuff. And you can see he, he definitely favors the anarchists a little bit more than the Marxists because they still have that romanticism, you know, the arts and crafts type. Um, and then the final the, the final section is where he provides what he calls a romantic critique of capitalism. And it's that romantic critique of capitalism that I find very interesting. Um, but I think it's because his theology is... Um, it's almost maybe Eastern Orthodox, you know? Uh, I, I want to get there. I, I haven't gotten there yet, but I feel like it's definitely Orthodox or Catholic, definitely not Protestant, 100% not Protestant. He constantly criticizes the Protestants for their covenant theology, constantly, constantly. So he has a problem with like the contractual covenantalism, um, but it's that, that infusion of grace. And I think what he sees then is that the romantics they open us up to the being of being they that poetry and um that music and that art can open us up to that that more than and i think it's because he's ultimately then some kind of universalist so it's not like he needs um a theory of salvation he doesn't need like a soteriological theory of his sacramental ontology because i think it's much more of um a metaphysical idea that that capitalism distorts the beauty of love that is offered for all via, let's say, the Christian meta narrative. Um, and therefore, to reclaim that, we need a type of critique that opens us up, opens us up to that pre existent, um, salvific, metaphysical uh, framing of what life could be. Something along those lines. Yeah, I'd be curious to come back when you've when you've finished it and see if there's some um, dialogue with Orthodox thinkers, capital O Orthodox thinkers, yeah. in that you know to put an extremely broad brush on it, um, Orthodox thinkers largely tend to focus more on the incarnation as being a really important, like the important, the like supreme ultimate aspect of um, the salvific uh, enterprise. In that incarnation is about sort of transcendence entering into imminence, like basically sort of gracing it, right? Mm. Um, God becoming a human being. And so that sort of changes our view of, of nature. It makes it not being the sort of disenchanted, dead, billiard balls type thing, but actually sort of, you know, enchanting it with the divine. Um, and whereas for like Protestants, incarnation is just a means towards um, escape. Sort of, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a means towards like, well, this, this is a necessary condition, uh, incarnation for dying as a human being for the sins of uh, humankind, right? He just simply has to be human to pay this price. So he Otherwise can fulfill the work. law and then so that God can punish him, right? Yeah, exactly. So it, it's just sort of, a, sort of a necessary means towards the end, but it's not itself all that important. Uh, by yeah, whereas for the orthodox idea, the incarnation is about kenosis, right? And Protestants, I don't think, get the emptying, right? It is when when Jesus becomes flesh when he becomes the law that isn't that he comes to fulfill the law from the orthodox perspective but it's rather that he kind of um he he embodies himself into the material presence to kind of erupt into right into the imminent sphere yeah i mean i'm not sure that jesus really was like in ketosis on the cross maybe he was oh no you said kenosis <laughs> dude okay, hey, yeah. he's ripped brother i'm sure he was <laughs> He was keto all the way. Keto or paleo, what even or whatever. <laughs> what was it um, from Always Sunny? Uh, um, who's the Who's the one that's like you on Always Sunny? Like the like the the devil like the demonic version of you, the devil on your shoulder version. Oh, Dennis, fuck off. Dennis, fucking. De <laughs> we had a Dennis system. We called the Austin system. So let's not pretend here. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. But no, Dennis has the like like Jesus on the cross look right when he wants to get real fit and amazing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally, dude. Totally. <laughs> oh god. Yeah. No, I, um, I still hold that that Dennis is you if you were um, the worst person, like the worst possible, uh, like you without all your virtues, you know. If yeah, but it's like, a damn good thing you have all your virtues. So when I'm <laughs> when I'm really drunk and I'm in a shitty mood, Dennis comes out. I don't think I've seen you drunk, and you don't really get in a shitty mood. So I'm not. No, I don't. I just it. get super happy. <laughs> That's it. I'm just not angry. Dennis has a rage within him that I just don't really yeah. have. Yeah. yeah. Oh God, he makes me laugh. Um, 
So yeah, so I'm interested, but I do think I, I think my my final summary remark is I think I love the fact that he critiques this myth of secularity. This is definitely in the literature of post secularism, right? Um, I like how he he dispels that myth. Um, I like how he points our attention to the idea that there are contemporary forms of uh, enchantment that still persist or what he would call misenchantment. And for me, I think what's really useful is I would want to then open this up, and I am actually opening this up into my next project, where I'm looking at like financial pricing models and algorithms as being thergic, um, thergic practices that mitigate uncertainty with a capital U. The uncertainty is like that divine that you need to appease from beyond you know it's the uncertainty of the market with a capital m and so you have to like subordinate yourselves via a theological subordination to these uh figures and so then that means that like all of our pricing models that the algorithm that um the ratings like stock prices and things like that that uh um, the mechanisms for determining, you know, liquidity injections, you know, basically interest rates. Those things are kind of thergic processes in a neoliberal enchanted or misenchanted regime. And so I, th I find a lot of ammunition and resources in this just at like a kind of larger formal level. Um, but I just – I don't want to go the full Heideggerian route where – you know, that like, or like the full poetic route. Like I, I, I kind of want to go there, but I want to materialize <laughs> it, you know, rather than just opening up to the being of being as that which reveals itself, that which is the showing in the showing kind of shit, which is cool. And I like, I like it because it gets us beyond reductive materialism, but I don't want to just throw my hands into the air at some point and be like, but that's it. It's just, you know, being with a capital B and you can't really speak of it. You can only kind of perpetually speak around it and poetically induce its showing or whatever I, I think i still want to speculatively engage this is why i'm into deleuze i think he speculatively engages with the quote-unquote being of being what deleuze calls difference pure difference or imminence itself and i think that's why i like that type of thinking is i want to be able to open myself up to the universal in the singular but not quantify or measure or reduce to like like uh, mathemat mathematizable bits, the universal, but to somehow be able to engage with it, you know? Because I think, I, I don't want to just be like, it's the infinite of the expanding universe, like stardust kind of shit, because that still is quantifying it according to a particular type of um, uh, extensional logic, whereas I'm kind of looking more at intensive variation in the Deleuzean sense, the pure difference, not things that are externally related the bill uh the the billiard ball kind of atomism that you get in physics right i kind of want to still have a room for speculative metaphysics but 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 still drawing from this idea that um that there's still an enchantment going on that opens us up to that 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 hidden abode and that what's really at stake then is in what ways is that hidden abode expressed like what induces it which would be the actualization of the virtual, right? Like, what is it that causes that transition of the, the regime of the universal or not the regime, the realm of the universal or of pure difference or of the virtual or whatever? Um, what causes it to actualize itself and what takes place in, in its actualization of itself? In what way is it coded? And if it's coded in, um, under the conditions of capitalism, then that means that all of the actualizations are going to then kind of ultimately benefit, if you will, a particular like political economic regime. You know, does that make any sense? I just, yeah, I, mean, I literally, dude, I literally just blacked out for a second. I don't even, I just like went into one right there. Do you ever have those moments? <laughs> like, <laughs> like a fugue state? Yeah, dude, like time just stopped. <laughs> I went into a full on flow moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that you're absolutely right that the virtue of, of this project seems to be both its critique of the notion of disenchantment, which is not a new thing, and then also um, its sort of circumspect use of Marxism, um, both being uh, praising and criticizing uh, the Marxist critique of disenchantment. And I think that goes back to a lot of stuff we talked about with during the G. A. Cohen book uh, last year, um, and the and the kind of re understanding um, a kind of, of Marxism absence uh, that sort of. Um, promise of disenchantment in the future i like that a lot i don't yeah. know that the solution here is really going anywhere 
for a lot of the reasons you said. And I also obviously want to do speculative metaphysics as well. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, it makes me think that this whole idea of imagination and the sort of promise and potential of using imagination as a as a conceptual tool, it seems like this is maybe too too abstract and too broad, but I'm curious what you think about it. I don't know that that applies to the metaphysics. It seems like this whole project of like doing metaphysics and then moving on to the peripheral disciplines, that whole idea is just kind of a, f- a failure in my mind, um, which is of course like a kind of an ancient way of doing um, philosophy. And the imagination really should come in when it comes to the normative stuff, because that's when we actually get to areas that I think are uh, where imagination becomes, has potency. Right, not because those areas are necessarily more obscure or uh, more abstract than metaphysics. That's not true either. That's kind of like a almost like a like a positivist way of thinking. I don't want to celebrate that either. There's something about the sort of normative and political uh, kinds of thinking where we actually have to engage in the kind of speculation that can use imagination to sort of create new concepts. Right. Um, and that's where it just seems like imagination has that potency where I don't know that we need to do that in metaphysics. And in fact, it seems to make metaphysics harder um, and just and, and really doesn't set out any sort of uh, clear way of doing it, given that if you're just sort of you know using imagination, then it seems like no holds are barred. At least with metaphysics can be sort of a, like a guarding post of some sort for our imagination. Um, I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing here, but mm. uh, it just the, the 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 formal aspect of the project seems to me to be a little off. Um, even if I think you know bits and pieces of it are are helpful, um, but maybe in different guises. Does that make any sense? Mm, yeah, I'm trying to think because so there's a Heideggerian named John Salis who wrote a book called Force of the Imagination. And he develops a poetic imagination that I think would be the very thing that you're kind of saying, eh, I'm not sure that we should go there, right? And for him, it's been a little while since I read it. It's in my book, but I don't really remember everything. But basically, the idea of the poetic imagination is something that is open to what he calls like the tractive capacities of the elemental, which is the earth and the sky, primarily. So you have this like, traction this pulling this beckoning if you will from let's say the being of being in a very heideggerian sense but for salus it's in the elemental and so the earth and the sky in their excess they kind of induce if you will um a a potent and productive poetic form of imagination so imagination then isn't simply like um like a voluntarist transcending of the environments into which we're thrown, which I think is what you're more advocating, right? Like use it as the creative capacity to inventively overcome the material conditions, the exigencies, the um, limitations, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas he's kind of saying there's a kind of almost maybe for lack of a better word a kind of like prior transcendental conditioning that is essentially imaginative that relates to that tractive pull of the elemental and i think that that again opens up to this metaphysical idea of nature being graced right that there's almost like this equiprimordial to use a good heideggerian term this equiprimordial relation between a sacramental imagination and divine love for macaraher right and that that is like the the foundation of human history of anthropology social relations you know and then that's kind of getting back to an ontological project that i think is very similar to the one that milbank outlines that ontology of peace kind of thing again 
Which yeah, when was, I when I was I was talking with Martin Konings actually. So so in Martin's book, uh, The Emotional Logic of Capitalism, he does something very similar where he analyzes money as an icon, but he dispels of the Heideggerian stuff. And that's Martin's criticism of McCarraher's project. As he says, I like what McCarraher's doing, and actually um McCarraher is thanked, is acknowledged in Martin's acknowledgments because he read like early drafts of it. But Martin basically says, like I like the project, but in the end he's too much of a theologian. And I think that's the issue. He's too much of a – it's the Heideggerian metaphysics stuff that he doesn't like. Yeah, I mean it's no surprise. I mean there's like a, a kind of hand wavy moment in this essay where McCarraher says some people accuse romanticism of possibly leading to fascism. But it doesn't. <laughs> it's like, well, I mean, hello, Heidegger. Like that doesn't mean that it necessarily leads to fascism. That's again this whole like metaphysical determinacy thing where the metaphysics determines the, the politics and the normative content, which it doesn't, right? But it can follow from it. So you can't just assume that the proper metaphysics leads you towards the proper normative content. I think it could just as well lead you to fascism, right? Um, that's contingent that relationship. And mm. so, yeah, again, I just I it seems like again we mentioned Walter Brueggemann's prophetic imagination um, earlier in the episode. This is kind of I think what's formed my thinking on this in large part is the prophetic imagination isn't about reconstruction of metaphysics, right? It's about reconceptualizing the possible. Um, uh, social makeup that yeah. exists because we whatever social uh, makeup we have is going to seem necessary to us because it's what we've you know lived with we're going to have metaphysical uh, accounts of why it's necessary right and so imagination can kind of break that down it's like a conceptual tool to use um for critique mm -hmm. and for reimagining a new kind of for you know progress conceptually as well um but i i don't know that that's like the it's like the ground of our thinking, even if it's the beginning chronologically, because we have to sort of break apart the sort of uh, mystical uh, determinism of um, whatever order we currently have. It's not the like logical ground of our thinking. I don't, I don't think, and that's that's where I think I'm differing from what McCarraher and like the, the Heideggerian mode is. Mm. Yeah. Well, I say we go ahead and wrap it up there. Yeah, this what was super think? cool. Uh, I'm really yeah. interested to hear more about. I don't know that I can devote the time to reading that entire book but uh i'm nice. curious to hear more about your thoughts when, when you finish it it's very interesting cool. yeah yeah maybe i'll give a shitty minute <laughs> on it at the end <laughs> it shitty was or sticky, sticky depending upon yeah well it was already I, I a sticky that, leaves i can't I, I think it would have to be a shitty minute i'll find something to bitch about so okay <laughs> all right cool let's move on to the last segment All right, so um, speaking of sticky leaves and shitty minutes, you know we got to do the sticky leaves before we get out of here. Oh, yeah. So, Austin, uh, what's uh, bringing you meaning in a potentially meaningless universe? First of all, I just want to apologize to the listeners who don't give a shit about poetry and beauty and romance and enchantment. And You've we've been, been talking about <laughs> we've we've been talking about it a lot this episode, and so the next ten minutes, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more because I just saw a film that is very much in this vein. It is definitely a Heideggerian film because it is directed by a former Heideggerian scholar, uh, Terence Malick. I it didn't is, know that. Oh, yeah. Dude, he translated Heidegger's work. He was doing a PhD, and then he dropped out to make fucking films. Wow, I had no idea. Oh, yeah, dude. Um, he is a very... I mean, you. if you know this, it almost becomes like the mask comes off when you watch his films now hmm. because you're like... This motherfucker thinks he's Heidegger. <laughs> it's like <laughs> the poetic musings and shit like that. You know, I mean, he does it both formally um, and I think he does it in terms of the content as well. You know, like it, thin red line musing on what it means to be human. These very different experiences of love, the tensions, war, um, you know, courage and virtue and all of these existential themes. And then, um, you know, this like swelling music that uh, induces you into these heights that is definitely manipulative, but it's manipulative to try to like raise you up or to like open to to raise the humanitas of humanity higher, uh, in, you know, to kind of like distort a term that he used when he was criticizing Sartre. He said Sartre's existentialism doesn't raise the humanitas of, uh, of humanity high enough. Well, I think that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to raise, if you will, the humanitas of man higher. Um, and then I, I just watched his most recent film, uh, A Hidden Life. And for people who aren't familiar, it is um, based on a true story of a conscientious objector to World War II during Hitler's 
takeover of Austria. He's an Austrian farmer. And um, I, I just think it's almost I feel like it's a disservice to say if the film is good or bad. Because I don't even I, – what I, so what I want to say, and I tweeted about this, and I think I even put a little post on Facebook, which is the same thing as the tweet. But basically that I, I'm not even sure we can call this a film. And you know how Scorsese says that uh, Avengers films aren't cinema. I think mm -hmm. we could say that, uh, that Malick's films aren't cinema. They are something different. They are definitely like multimedia poetics or like oral and visual poetics. And I think that you definitely see that with this film because it is a film that really explores um, the beyond, the beyond uh, in a fallen world. And so you have the beautiful Austrian agrarian town um, where, where this kind of plays out, and that's one world which is the world of like toil and farming. And it isn't a romanticized like picture of the yeoman farmer, you know, that life is great and everything's in harmony. As a matter of fact, his wife at one point um, says something along the lines of like, it was adequate. And I really liked that mm. actually, um, because there's a recognition of the toil and the difficulty, let's say uh, in the like post fall Adamic state right? Um, and that everyone therefore is, is a part of this world of toil because that's the condition, the human condition into which we're thrown. And it's a religious town because, you know, we're talking like, you know, like late 30s, early 40s in Austria, so Catholic town. And so there are priests and bishops and there's faith and things like that. But the religion is almost secondary to actually what manifests itself uh, in the background as the longing for both Franz and his wife, which is the mountain and the mountain in the sky. And there are all these musings about birds and like meeting in the clouds and meeting in the mountains and stuff like that. And there's something about the mountain as being like the true cathedral with a capital C, even though there's a church uh, that you see, but the church is dwarfed by the mountains. The mountains are more grandiose. They're more transcendent and that there is a romanticism there, but the town itself, the agrarian lifestyle is still a world of toil. And you see that it's it's not talked about, but you see it constantly. They're constantly fucking harvesting and cutting and like digging, and they're dirty and they're you know it's 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 difficult, but at the same time they still it's adequate, you know. And I I thought that that was really lovely. And then the other world is the world of Hitler, and um, the world of the Nazis, which is a world of technology, which is a world of um, manufacturing, which is a world of violence and a world of instrumental rationality. And I think that's the key thing that Heidegger is pointing, or the Heidegger, <laughs> Freudian slip, <laughs> that Malik is pointing at. Um, it's the, the, the logic of techne or the logic of instrumental rationality that defines uh, the Hitlerian regime that really uh, is distinguished from the world of Franz, which then culminates in the, the ultimate uh, point of tension. But the reason I say that is because when he decides to object and to not swear the oath to Hitler, officers are constantly saying, who do you think is ever going to hear of your objections? Do you think that this is going to stop the war? Like they're always constantly trying to instrumentalize his objection and he doesn't really ever give an answer. The closest he ever comes is in a really lovely scene actually with the guy that played Hitler in the film The Fall. Remember that film? The one that was memed to death? I'm not with sure if I did. The angry Hitler when it's like him in the room like going. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That, Wasn't it so called Downfall? From, a downfall. I'm sorry. Not the fall. Yeah, yeah Downfall. Right. Yeah, Downfall. Um, and uh, and he actually is in this. He plays one of the kind of head officers, the head Nazi like judges at the end. Um, and uh, he basically asks him the same question that has been asked multiple times. Like, who do you think is going to do this? Why are you doing this? Blah, blah, blah. And he kind of basically, Franz basically says, you know, it's kind of like there's almost like this stirring within me and I can't not i i can't be like unfaithful or i can't i can't not attest to that light that is flickering kind of thing is the response that he gives which is really interesting because it's almost like infused into the the kind of the world of toil because of the human condition in the agrarian world there's still a beckoning of the truth and what is right because they're in the shadows of the cathedral and the mountain right 
which calls them that just calls them to that higher purpose to be faithful to the higher cause but you can't instrumentalize it you can't explain it you can't you can't bring it down to earth if you will through like some sort of code um whereas the world of hitler is all about code and it's that that constant codes which is you're swearing the hitler oath you're doing your duty um you're doing you're doing what you're doing for your people and your countrymen and for the homeland whatever and it's all about following the code following the values of the code that are imposed upon you and um it's the freedom that is in the one and, and franz actually says this at one point when he's in chains and he's in prison and they say oh you know don't you want to do this to get free and he says i am free and it's a really he doesn't like he doesn't like this oh it's such a it's basically profound, socrates yeah, basically, yeah, kind of, you know, and it's almost like he has become free because he's transcended the codes of instrumental rationality of the kind of Hitlerian regime of techne and violence and conflict and stuff like that. And so that's what like creates that dynamic tension is that they're constantly trying to understand him. And maybe he doesn't even really know he's just being faithful, if you will, to the truth or to what is right or to something. You know, and that's at least how it's. I, I've I've actually read a little bit about it. I guess in his own writings, he was a little bit more um, willing to justify his reasons, like he had a more explicit pacifism. Um, but that that in the film, at least, Malik tries. He he wants to portray him as not being so inclined towards giving justification. So, but I think it's absolutely beautiful. It's well acted. It's very long and it's very kind of meandering and. Um, non-standard in a cinematic sense, but uh, very provocative and and stimulating and definitely emotional. And um, I think there were some really interesting like textual references as well. Like the main actor, August Deal, he is notable for playing the Nazi in Inglorious Bastards down in the basement of that bar, you know, where they have the card game. Mm-hmm. And that's August Deal, but he's also in one of my favorite movies of all time called The Ninth Day, where he plays a Nazi officer who is in charge of releasing a Catholic priest. He gives him nine days to uh, draft a letter in support of Hitler, and the priest doesn't, but his role as the Nazi officer is so great because there's all these wonderful religious, like he was a seminary student, and there are all these like religious discussions between him and the priest where they're kind of like accusing each other of being Judases and stuff like that, but it's really, it's really well done, but it's just amazing that this guy has such, I mean, he's a German actor, so he's got this history of playing these Nazi officers, and now he is this objector, right? Mm -hmm. And it, I think that that's kind of a really nice casting decision, but Anyway, um, go see it. A Hidden Life by Terrence Malick. I think it's beautiful. It's long. It isn't a perfect film. Um, there were times when I kind of like phased in and out, you know, like I, I did wander a little, but then it came back in and then I was entranced and I was uplifted and um, I thought it was absolutely um, powerful, if nothing else. Do you think it's easier to watch a Malick film in theaters where you can't really go and do anything else? than hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, I just love the theater. I've talked about this before. I love the theater experience in general. I wish I could just only go to the theater. Like, I don't like sitting at home watching on my laptop or sitting at a friend's house and watching it on a big screen TV. Like, like it's a degraded form of the experience, you know? Yeah, yeah, I feel that. So, but yeah. That sounds super interesting. I'm actually even, maybe even more interested in watching this movie, The Tenth Day. <laughs> the Ninth that Day. sounds right up the my ninth, alley. The Ninth Day. Oh, or dude. The Ninth Day, sorry. Dude, it's so fucking good. It's a German film. Oh my gosh, man. It's so good. And his character is, oh, the discussions that they have, it, it's so good. And it's brutal and it's beautiful and it's haunting and it's tense and it's dreary and German, you know? Oh, <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm all about that. German movies are always best when they're the best at sort of having philosophical and, and theological discussions as like the centerpiece of the film. American movies suck ass at that. Yeah. yeah For American not. movies, it's always about discussing opinions rather than discussing ideas. And they suck at it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's why Malick is so interesting as an American filmmaker is because he never discusses opinions. He's always exploring ideas or Is he sentiment. from the Pacific Northwest? Dude, he's from like fucking Texas, dude. Really? Yeah, he's, a, he's an evangelical boy. Huh. Then became a Heideggerian scholar. No wonder you like him. Yeah, I know. I know, I know. So, 
But it's I mean, like you in a possible future world. If in, in a world that I wish I could live, um, <laughs> I would love to just make make movies and translate and read philosophy shit. But like, I I love his filmography in general. You know, like I think Badlands and Days of Heaven are amazing. Thin Red Line is amazing. Tree of Life is amazing. Some of the other stuff I'm not too keen on, like To the Wonder and Night of Cups and what is it, Song to Song or whatever. The, I didn't even see it. Um, I only watched little bits of it. It just he kind of he kind of got lost in just pure poetry which was whatever but um this is kind of a return to a narrative form that is more akin to uh the structure of thin red line tree of life um maybe you could even say days of heaven and badlands but not not at, definitely not as tight narr- narratively as like badlands which is just a straight narrative you know but Days of Heaven is when he starts experimenting with like the voiceover. I mean, he does a little bit in in Badlands too, but like where it really starts to get a little bit more the abstract editing and nonlinear and stuff like that. But this is it. This definitely is more nonlinear. It's not that it's nonlinear. It's more um, like jumpy. It jumps a lot, you know. Hmm. So. What is your favorite Malick film? You have a favorite? Um, maybe Tree of Life. Yeah, even though I need to rewatch Thin Red Line. I haven't seen it in a long time, and I imagine that that... And I never... Uh, did I see New World? I don't think I saw New World. That's the one with Colin Farrell, and it's like the Pocahontas, John Smith story. But what about you? Are you, are you much of a Malick fan? I mean, not really, but mostly because of ignorance. I mean, I've seen um, Tree of Life and... Um, uh, what's the other one? Thin Red Line? Thin Red Line, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, you have to have seen that. Yeah, um, but that, that's really it. Yeah. Yeah, his early you stuff... Come, you need I, to come at Malick films with a certain in a certain mood, to use a Heideggerian term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I would definitely recommend to check out, for people who don't like his like musing poetic style that comes especially after Tree of Life. I mean, Tree of Life is pretty poetic, so is Thin Red Line. But um, Days of Heaven and Badlands... They're just good stories, man. Very kind of an Americana sentiment to them, or sensibility, I should say, to them. Um, you know, he's he's definitely got them southern roots. And I wonder if you could almost even... I wonder if people have written about, like, Days of Heaven and Badlands as being southern gothic. But... Um, huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because he definitely has that that feel to those films, now that I think about it, like, retroactively. Yeah, yeah. I'll but yeah. check out Badlands for that reason. That sounds interesting. Yeah, it's Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek. They're great. Spacek, Super yeah. young. Yeah. yeah, they're great. They're great. They're great. And then Days of Heaven is Richard Gere. Ah, yeah, yeah. Old Dick, like, like a late seventies or something like that. So, but yeah, check out check out uh, Malik films. Check out uh, A Hidden Life. Be prepared for a three hour film that isn't going to entertain or amuse you, but that you still might benefit from seeing it. <laughs> nevertheless. All right, sounds good. Sweet. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up the episode there. Yeah, dude? Yeah, yeah. All right, well, if you want to reach out to us, hit us up, Twitter, Insta, owls underscore at underscore Don. You can find us. You can email us, owls at denpodcast at gmail.com. What else? Uh, you can, as we mentioned earlier, support us on patreon.com slash owls at Don through various tiers of support and get all the goodies that we have there. Uh, and also, you can give us a five-star rating and review. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, you can ask a question in that review. And if we can answer it in a minute or two, and it doesn't involve too many um, private details about our personal lives, we will try mm-hmm. our best to answer it on the next episode. Sounds good. I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, dude? Just one more thing I can think of, dude. Oh, what's that? Das Adani, Mary Constance.